to kind of help us sort through the latest uh, refined executive order. Good morning, John. Good to see you. Hey, good morning, Bree. Good morning, Chris. Morning, morning, morning. I guess we'll just uh, start uh, at the beginning. Uh, if, if you could, maybe the timeline on what led to this uh, refined uh, executive order that was issued last night. Sure. You know, um, of course, um, you know, as the governor has mentioned, not every executive order is going to be perfect. Not every public health guidance is going to be perfect. And we recognize that. And I think the people of Guam recognize that. And so um, one of the over the weekend, we've of course heard the concerns of um, you know the business community the restaurant community we've heard the concerns of people who are concerned about the vaccination and we went back and we we had a discussion with the governor we had a discussion with um, her advisors and we used that opportunity to kind of um, amend the executive order to fit those needs um, that really were um, pointed out by the community and as the governor has mentioned she, to those concerns, she implemented it through this amended executive order and are these recommendations that you did you guys meet with GHRA, the um, yep. the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, we had an The Go governor ahead. had an opportunity to meet with um, Mary Rhodes and some of the um, board members uh, uh, yesterday, and so they were part of the discussion uh, that led to this amended EO. And again, it's not a perfect EO. It's not a, it's not going to be pu a perfect public health guidance, but we did what we could. Uh, to try to um, find a common ground in the areas of concern, especially in response to the public health emergency. Mm -hmm. Now, can you kind of go through the, the self-attestation and, and um, just how that works? Because I think, you know, public health, they already have an issue and concerns about a contact tracing and specifically to bars. And we've had Chima on, um, you know, over the last uh, several yeah, weeks, and, and he's been talking. Go ahead. Yeah, he's been saying that basically uh, there's two issues. Uh, one <coughs> is that uh, sometimes when people fill out the contact tracing log, they're uh, putting fake phone numbers, sometimes yeah. not even the real name. And then the other side is when they do the contact tracing, especially um, where we see some clusters at the bars, uh, there was at least one bar owner, but I want to say he had mentioned a few others who um, didn't cooperate with the investigation and didn't want to provide contact tracing logs. So already uh, we see that there's an issue with um, the honor system, if you will, and having people uh, sign in. Right. So, so go ahead. Yeah, so the, the self-attestation uh, was, again, another concern that was brought up, right, with the proof of vaccination cards upon entry at these covered establishments. And, you know, the community has been um, extremely great in terms of uh, showing that, you know, they can rise to being able to respond to contact tracing. It's not perfect, but, you know, for the, for the most part, I know there are challenges, but for the most part, I, contact tracing uh, has been successful. Uh, again, there are challenges and we're going to meet them. But with regard to the self-attestation of the vaccination upon entry, is that we're, re we're really relying on the trust of people who are going to be entering these establishments. And what's going to happen is that on these contact log sheets, um, we're going to, uh, public health, I believe, will be issuing um, uh, a, a form that kind of uh, allows a person to check off if they're vaccinated. And that attestation, again, will be used in the event that we do have to go back to contact tracing to contact those individuals absent um, the need to prevent um, an ID, I mean, the uh, verified uh, vaccination card. Um, a lot of people have either lost them. A lot of people, uh, you know, uh, don't have copies of them. So, you know, we're going to give them time as, as well as give public health time uh, to be able to uh, provide those replacement cards in the event they request them. So it's the same thing as taking a picture of your vaccination card on your phone and using it to provide um, as a proof or a validation upon entry. It's the same concept. John, so uh, Friday at the, um, the press conference up at uh, Adeloup, uh, the governor and her team, they came out and they really came out hard on the unvaccinated. Uh, they called it a pandemic of the unvaccinated, right? And um, she talked about how her executive order, uh, the unrefined one issued Friday, how it would um, help stop the spread, right? So how do you kind of balance, right, the very real public health concerns that you guys have with trying to appease the public outcry. I mean, did, did this refined EO and, and you guys' reaction to the public, did it take the teeth out of what the governor said was the best approach to control the spread on Friday? No, I, I don't think so. I think um, what it did was it, it allowed us uh, to go back 
and work with our stakeholders to actually operationalize uh, what the uh, executive order intends to implement. And that is the ability for, um, again, these covered establishments to uh, verify vaccinations. So um, it does not take away your right or your choice or your decision uh, to vaccinate or, or to, uh, yeah, to receive the vaccine or not. What it does say is that, you know, we're allowing those who have, who have committed to the safe environment to be comfortable, to have the confidence in knowing that um, when they enter these establishments and you're vaccinated, um, you're going to have the ability to know that this place is safe, that you're safe as amino. Um, you know, uh, again, the vaccine does not, um, uh, what do you call it, prevent you from um, contracting COVID, but it, it definitely uh, reduces the risk of you uh, con uh, contracting the disease. So, you know, it just provides a safer environment in whatever establishment that you enter. What, what's your response to uh, the, I guess, the Republican Party? Um, they're calling the latest executive order, uh, sets the parameters of segregation, creates a deep division within our community. Segregation is never a healthy decision. Then you saw the protest that happened uh, over the, uh, the weekend, you right. know, our body, our choice. Yeah. Well, first off, uh, you know, the governor, um, public health, I think the rest of the community um, has never used the word segregation. Uh, I think the Republicans were the ones who used that. And if, if, if history, it tends to repeat itself, then let's look deeper at history. I mean, we're talking about, you know, segregation in terms of slavery, discrimination in terms of slavery, segregation against men and women. That's not what we're doing here. This, this vaccine does not discriminate. It will take, it will contract regardless of your medical condition, regardless of your religious exemption, regardless of how much money you make or who you are, it does not discriminate. And so what we're saying in terms of this executive order is that we're trying to get our community as safe as possible through this vaccine that has been recently fully approved by the FDA. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're definitely not segregating our community in this sense. And I think that the, um, uh, overwhelming response by the community uh, based on the executive order on Friday to head to the vac vaccination pods to receive in even, even their first dose um, is indicative of what our community uh, aims to achieve, which is, again, a safer community through the use of this vaccine. Is it, John, or is it just that people are, are feeling like they're being forced to take the shot and there's no other option? Because remember on Friday, the, um, no, I think the EO said that, I mean, you could basically I, lose your job. I think a lot of people have were, you know, for those who were on the fence, uh, some who were who were waiting for the full FDA approval, some who still had questions or concerns um, about the the efficacy of the of the vaccine, some who um, just couldn't make a decision. I think you know, kind of helped them uh, arrive at that decision. And again, um, you know, our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can again have a safer community. That's the bottom line. I mean, you know, we're giving opportunities for those who don't um, um, who don't want to receive the vaccination for whatever personal reason they have uh, to submit to a, a weekly testing so that, again, uh, for their sake and for the sake of those who they are going to be surrounded with um, in, in their workplace, in a restaurant, um, can be assured that every everybody that enters again is going to be as safe as possible, whether you have the vaccine or whether you have a negative test result. Uh, John, so with the testing, right, obviously uh, those people who aren't going to get uh, vaxxed are going to be availing themselves of the weekly uh, testing. Are there any plans to make it more convenient? Because I'm sure, uh, as you're well aware, <laughs> people are waiting for hours, right, mm -hmm. to get tested. Chris, I, okay, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, I went to the vaccine, I mean, to the uh, testing site, um, I think it was last week. And, yeah, I recognize that, you know, people are are waiting about an hour on average uh, to get tested. And, you know, we're working with public health to improve that process. Um, you know, I know that uh, there have been many in the community who have asked public health to kind of create a digital platform so that they can, you know, sign up for their testing. Um, I can assure you that we're working feverishly to get that achieved. Um, one of the other um, uh, pieces of um, technology that we're also going to be implementing or we're going to try to implement is the use of um, the, the state of New York and California, and I think Hawaii has a form of it. It's called a, it's a, it's basically a vaccination pass that would help us, um, you know, help businesses also 
uh, kind of um, eliminate the need for somebody to really stand and verify each person that comes in. And they would just basically scan a QR code. We've done this with the health declaration form over at the airport. And that's a similar technology we're going to try to implement as soon as we can uh, with regard to the, uh, the vaccination parts. We did have a... a no, go ahead. Oh, I can't. Yeah. I'm going to ask something. We did have a, a comment in here, John, and I... Um, you know, because we get public health in here all the time, and, and from what public health sure. and, the, and the doctors say, um, that vaccinated, unvaccinated, uh, spread the virus, um, well, I mean, pretty equally. So we did have a comment here about the uh, governor in her address on Friday had said that vaccination helps uh, stem transmission of the virus. Can you kind of ex explain uh, that comment? Because from what we understand, uh, all the science says that vaccination only uh, helps stave off serious illness and hospitalization. Yeah, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. The latter part of your comment is that it staves off hospitalization. And just yesterday, we've seen an increase, an uptick in, in hospitalization, and we're seeing uh, more people being admitted to the ICU. And a majority of those people, as you know, are unvaccinated. And so, um, you know, um, I don't think anybody uh, is here to argue whether or not you can contract the virus, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. I think we acknowledge that. Uh, the science acknowledges that. But I think, it, uh, you know, there is some data that um, also puts out that it reduces the risk of transmission. Uh, of course, not 100 percent. But the, the more important thing is hospitalization. And that's the critical thing that we look at every single day. Um, you know, I know the governor, myself and others, uh, you know, we received the hospital census and, you know, that is kind of our our indicator. It's not our only indicator, but it's it's a clear uh, signal for us of how we're doing in our response and um, how we have to be able to adapt and to adjust uh, to what needs to be um, responded to. Can you clarify the um, guidance uh, regarding contact sports? And uh, is this just applicable to um, outside sports, not um, necessarily school sports programs, like the GDOE's ESA League and the AAAAG? Is it mandatory yeah, vaccinations know, for, for, for them or not for them? Right. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to look into that one a little bit more. I know that I heard, uh, you know, Senator Adder earlier talking about uh, um, trying to get those who are who are not vaccinated into into weekly testing or some type of testing so that they can um, participate in these organized sports. Uh, I think that's a that's a fair point. That's a valid point. I, I don't know the details of that, but I can definitely look into it. Okay. You know, uh, so yesterday at the legislature, the override attempt of Bill 11 uh, failed, um, right? I mean, it was hot debate, though. And then so we had a bunch of the uh, senators on, but we did have Senator Sabina Perez on, uh, the procurement mm -hmm. chair. And, um, you know, one of the, the uh, pieces of conversation that we hear about during this pandemic, uh, is a lot of it is with procurement, right, and the emergency authority that the governor um, says that she has. And so we had the audit come out about the first round of the procurement, um, we, I don't think we got a comment from Adeloupe on that. So what was your, your comment on that audit from, uh, uh, public auditor to BJ Cruz relative to the first round of the hotel, uh, procurement, uh, John, that was performed by the former legal counsel and son of law to the, um, governor. Sure. So, you know, um, on the, on that, on the procurement issue, you know, we have been consistent in, 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 including in our response. And I think when you read the audit that was published by the OPA, we were consistent about the use of the governor's public health emergency authority. Um, you know, again, um, could there have been processes and steps to um, improve, improve the way that things were procured, of course. Um, but, you know, again, this pandemic um, is, has never been experienced uh, by any of us. Uh, quite frankly, in this administration or any administration for that matter. And so uh, using the resources that we had and, and the tools that we had in our toolbox in terms of being able to procure a facility um, in a matter of, of days as we expected the first flight to come in with unknown positives, you know, that's that's something that uh, we've been consistent about in terms of the governor's authority to institute uh, the use of those uh, quarantine facilities. Right. So, so I know that there are the... Um purchases, right, that, I mean, on the surface are totally justified, like the quarantine, right? But then uh, recently I was able to report on this appeal before the OPA about the um, emergency procurement of the golf carts uh, by the governor's office. Um, and Senator Sabina had said that this procurement, there were a lot of red flags with the way the uh, specs were changed um, after business hours. I'm sure you're well aware of it, but did you guys have a 
a comment on that since sure. the governor's office's uh, name was all over everything? Yeah, well, yeah, first things first, uh, the governor's office was not the one that procured those, um, those golf carts. I can assure you that. Uh, those uh, golf carts were procured by uh, Homeland Security Office of Civil Defense. And, um, you know, depending uh, in the system, right, whatever, I'm, I'm not 100% um, uh, about this, but uh, the Office of Homeland Security and Civil Defense falls under the governor's office. And so um, from time to time, you know, the governor's office address is used uh, to um, um, address billings or address um, statements or invoices. And so um, when that particular purchase order was awarded, um, I think the governor's office was used, but it, the intention and the procurement was actually done by uh, the Office of Civil Defense, not the governor's office, to be clear. Uh, but it, the document said it was delivered to the governor's office. No, I, uh, they were delivered uh, to the Office of Civil Defense. I can assure but, you. But that. the document says that it was delivered to. So we're just going by what the documents yeah. say. But I mean, just uh, was that yeah. emergency purchase of the golf carts justified, though, uh, John? You know, uh, from what I understand, um, you know, I know part of this is again under procurement uh, protest, and um, so I, I'm not going to be able to comment on all the details. That, you know, I leave that to the General Se uh, Services Agency, and of course, the agency that procured it. Um, but I do know that. Um, at the beginning and even in the middle of um, both the testing and the vaccination, uh, there was a need for those resources. So I know that those were formally submitted through uh, what they call up at home, the, the DLAN. And so I think there's documentation for that. Okay. I, just one last one, because I know Bree's got a, a few. Uh, the Republicans are asking me to ask if the Democrat senators met with the governor yesterday morning before session. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Did the Democrat senators meet with the governor before yesterday's uh, session relative to the Bill 11 override or anything? Right. The, the governor the governor did meet with Democratic uh, leadership, um, and so, yes, uh, she did. Can you tell us anything about what the substance of the meeting was about? Was there anything about the ARP or? No. You know, uh, one of the things that the, the main message between both uh, the governor and the speaker was basically having... Um, a unified message uh, in response to you know the concerns and the anxiety that's experienced in the community, and you know um, it was a meeting that uh, the governor had asked for um, because she felt that it was important um, to uh, ensure that uh, you know um, between the legislature and uh, of course the executive branch that we're doing our part to ensure that we continue to um, assure the people of Guam that we're working. Um, we you know regardless of our differences on the issues that we're working. Um, and in the best interests of serving and protecting our people. Um, do you have any updates on the All Rise program? Yeah, so the All Rise, um, you know, Daphne would have all the details, but I, but the directive was, of course, to have that launch by September mm -hmm. uh, 1st. Uh, I know that she's going to be implementing an application process uh, that's going to be uh, both online and, uh, of course, available uh, on hard copy. And I know that she's working with the Mayor's Council of Guam with the different mayor's offices to ensure that, that those forms are, are um, given out to the people so that they be, they can begin that process. And it should be a pretty straightforward process. Um, you know, as soon as the application is received, reviewed, and, uh, you know, they are, um, their eligibility, eligibility is determined, um, we should see payment in short order. Any uh, final decisions on uh, the location for the new uh, hospital slash medical uh, facility? Right. Um, so Eagles Field continues to be the number one um, so site for the hospital. Um, you know, and so we're working. Everybody is working um, um, in that in in one effort to you know make that location uh, possible. And so that continues to be the main site. And I wanted to go back to uh, the executive order and give uh, Adeloupe the opportunity to kind of address uh, mm -hmm. some of the businesses and other uh, concerns from the community that uh, the governor doesn't have legal authority to implement this vaccine mandate. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of explain and address concerns from the community that's that that question whether or not the governor has the legal authority to implement a vaccine mandate yeah the, uh, think, on the private um, sector right right so i think if um you know if you you know when one reads the executive order i uh, you know our legal counsels have worked 
um, hard to ensure that you know whatever is going to be put in this executive order is enforceable is enforceable uh, to the fullest extent whether it's going to be through you know existing case law um, recent court decisions that we're seeing throughout the United States even including some Supreme Court decisions um, also you know um, through her the Public Health Emergency Authority or, or her Emergency Act Authority and so you know um, with the full weight and force of those uh, particular uh, provisions, I think that um, you know it is our goal to work to um, have the full cooperation and support of the business community. Um, again, it's not always perfect. Again, you know um, one of the things that I agree with Mary Rhodes, um, president of GHRA, is the ability to operationalize all of the mandates that are coming out, and with um, you know with the ability to continue to collaborate and cooperate with each other, I think we're going to be able to achieve all of that. Uh, John, you know, earlier you talked about the uh, Democratic leadership meeting with the governor relative to a lot of the uh, concerns and frustration with um, the community. I kind of wanted to ask you to address like maybe some of the communications uh, issues and just uh, messaging out a lot of these um, policies and executive orders. So just take, for example, this uh, recent one. We had the press conference late on a Friday. I mean, huge announcement. Uh, not a lot of opportunity for the media to I'm not even ask questions for the sake of asking questions, but just to really ask questions about the information contained in the EO so that we can then disseminate it to you know, our consumers. Uh, so then we go the whole weekend. Uh, guidance comes out at 8. Then, you know, obviously the backlash yesterday and to a refined EO uh, today. You know, we had some callers on and just going around talking to the community, whether it's this situation or... Are we going to pay the rise or not follow the EO with the rise? There's just a, a lot of times, a lot of confusion. I mean, going back to, I was thinking about when the governor during the press conference back in, the, I think it was before the surge when she was talking about the roadblocks, she had said something about what letter do we got to, you got to put in your car to go grocery shopping and to put this letter. And something as simple as that, right, sets off people thinking that that's what it is and it just creates a lot of anxiety fear and frustration that we still see up to now and i feel like a lot of it is because you guys don't have consistent messaging like this refined eo comes out in the middle of the night 9 30 with a facebook video you know i mean it's a struggle to get the warm bodies from Adeloupe on the show to just answer the basic questions that uh you know about information so if, if you could kind of uh, address that yeah, you know, um, as we navigate this pandemic, um, again, you know, there there is no um, binder that I can turn to that would give me all the answers or even the governor for that matter. So a lot of the decisions that we make are definitely na not made um, on two points, one in a vacuum and two uh, in haste. We, we try to, as best as possible, uh, take into account all the circumstances, all the, you know, all the, all the challenges that um, we try to kind of put on a table and, and say, hey, these are the things that um, we're going to have to be able to address and again it's not always perfect and i think that uh, one of the things that we uh, can we can agree upon is communication and you know it's a two-way street you know we one of the things that we are challenged with is you know being able to again put all of this together so that you know the people of guam can you know can um take it and uh, and and you know apply it in their daily life uh what that's one part the other part is making sure that everything is legally sound uh, so that when we are challenged or, you know, when there are questions or concerns are, are raised that, you know, we have, um, you know, the, the proper foundation to be able to justify the actions that the governor is taking um, in response to the public health emergency. Right. And then the third part, of course, is trying to get out there ahead of misinformation that's being spread. And so that's one of the challenges that we're having. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you can appreciate even with the use of social media. It has its advantages and disadvantages, but, but the goal to get out information as soon as possible, um, um, you know, is, it, it has always been our goal. And so whether you receive it at nine o'clock at night or in mid, at, at midnight, um, you know, it's not our intention to hold information uh, within ourselves. We want to put it out there and then we would um, we could do a better job at coming out um, the following day or hours later, or whether a statement is attached or a video is attached to those um, uh, public health guidances or those executive orders that we uh, come out and make ourselves available so that we can assure our community um, that one, we have nothing to hide, and number two, that we're doing everything humanly possible uh, to ensure that um, they get the proper information and that we're doing everything we can, uh, again, to ensure the safety of our people. 
John, and, and, and the other said, part, and the other part to that is giving them the confidence in it that everything that that is coming out from us is uh, true and accurate. Hi, John. You say you talk about uh, communication, decisions not made in haste, but yet you have the physicians advisory uh, board chair coming on the show saying these aren't recommendations that you know we recommended, and you have JHRA coming on say, saying that, yeah, we met on a Thursday, but when that press conference happened, I was blindsided because that was not what was discussed. Yeah, the Chamber of Commerce, right. you know, also concerned about the executive order. So, yeah. you know, who's, so, who's advising the governor? So, you know, the, the thing about this is that the governor takes into account all the recommendations, all the issues that um, is presented before her. Not everything, um, you know, as in, in the advisory rules, um, are going to be uh, factored into these executive orders uh, or, or these public health guidances. And you know, our goal is to work again together to try to make sure that we don't miss a beat in that. And there are times where we will come up short. I think that everybody acknowledges that, especially most especially us. And so when we issued out this amended amended um, executive order. Um, Part of that was to again say that we we do we do listen and we we hear the concerns and the issues and and that we're going to do our part to ensure that we alleviate those issues and those concerns when they come about, and you know again an indication of that was our ability to get back on onto a meeting with uh, Mary Rhodes and say hey you know um, these are some of the things where we differed upon and we we proceeded because we it, it was in the governor's best interest in terms of uh, you know stemming the numbers that were coming out. And so we're able to come to a, a place where we say, okay, give us some time to operationalize this, give us some time to implement this. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, we will execute the mandate that comes out from the governor's office. Transparency has been a big criticism uh, with the administration, whether it's uh, you guys don't want to tell anyone your ARP plan. Uh, whether it's directors going down to the legislature. It's so weird because they'll come on, we get the directors on here, and thank you for the accessibility, and they'll say, like, oh, we're getting, you know, for example, Uncle Carl says, we're getting $30 million from uh, the Gov for this or that. Then they go down to the legislature, and it's like a big secret. They can't tell the senators, right? So we have the senators meet with the governor about this American Rescue Plan. Uh, then we don't hear anything. Then we try and ask uh, you guys um, for information. We don't get anything. We got senators who have to send FOIAs. So just find out where we're at with, you know, how we're going to spend this money. Like, what's the big deal? Why is it such a big secret? And how do you yeah, kind of right. address those criticisms? The very real ones, John, about the administration's lack of transparency. Right. And, you know, um, so one of the things that, uh, you know, I have to say about transparency is like, and you've, and you've acknowledged this, is our ability to make sure that, you know, all our subject matter experts are basically our directors are available to both the senators and to and to the media, uh, regardless of who it is. And so, you know, that's a commitment you'll continue to have from us. Um, regarding the ARP, one of the things that the governor has been clear about is, you know, the uh, we have the big, what you know, what I would call the big ticket items or the big priorities that of the ARP. One of them being the Rise Act, which is, you know, which we fully uh, funded uh, according to the law. And you know, there are other priorities like the fifteen million dollars that we used uh, as a subsidy to GPA to. Um, you know, kind of decrease the power bills for our people. Um, and so, you know, those are some things that we put out there. Um, when we get into the nitty gritty of, uh, of the individual agency budgets, uh, our, our biggest concern is that, you know, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, misinformation um, that's spread out there with, with regard to their budgets. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to avoid. I can assure you, Chris and Bree, that in the coming, um, you know, maybe coming weeks, we will have a full, um, uh, rollout plan of the ARP um, as we refine um, these budgets and you know we get through this you know one of the things that we want to do is make sure we get through this budget session and so you know that's of course the responsibility of the legislature so um, I, I think that's something that we can look forward to. So what grade would you give the administration like one to ten in terms of uh, transparency? I give ourselves a ten. Absolutely. I mean, if there was any 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 reason for people to feel that this administration is not being transparent, then you know they have every opportunity to call us out on it. And you know, we will we wherever um, we feel that we disagree with with um, 
with a, 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 a concern that we were not being transparent, we'll, we'll be happy to, you know, discuss it and always do better. What was up with that response to Senator Moylan, the, the communications director, Crystal Pan- Paco San Augustine uh, sent? I mean, he was asking for a FOIA and her response, I felt was pretty disrespectful uh, to a sitting senator, but I understand it's politics, right? But that, that tone, we've seen it a lot in um, the administration's eagerness to kind of like get into these little snarky back and forths with uh, their opponents. Uh, so who, who kind of greenlighted that? And that was that just uh, you guys having a bad Which day? One was it? The response Which to, one was? to Senator Moylan about how uh, Senator Moylan doesn't know what a FOIA is. I mean, because at the end of the day, he's just asking for information that you guys could have easily provided. But instead, there was a release from uh, Crystal that uh, basically called out the senator and said he does fake work. Is there really he a place for that? You, it was a FOIA related to ARP money and what uh, what bank it was uh, deposited into. And so there was a response from Crystal. You didn't see this response? Do we have it? No, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember of, of all the, you know, we get a letter from Senator James Moylan, I think, every 20 <laughs> minutes. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, John, it, it, is there... still on the envelope. But, you know, with regard to Crystal's response or the response that came out, you know, I think one of the, what, the, the bottom line is this, um, you know, uh, everybody is working hard to be, to, to respond to every issue that comes up. And, you know, um, the use of the FOIA, uh, of course, is a privilege and it's a right for, I mean, it, no, it's not a privilege. It's a, it's a right by our community. And so when we, when information is already available in, in whatever means, it doesn't have to be directly from the governor's office, but when the information is already out there, then I think that it does create unnecessary uh, work and it's really um, a distraction for us as we continue to do our work to have to respond to FOIAs when information is already out there. And that's the bottom line. Okay. And I guess, uh, did you have any other questions? No, I, did you have any other questions? Well, I mean, I have like a lot, but oh. I don't have oh, time. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really want to just kind of... I know, I know. <laughs> I just wanted to stress, uh, give you the opportunity to stress the point about, you know, the need uh, for the vaccinations um, yeah. and... Uh, to prevent the hospitalizations from from going up. Yeah, um, and, and I don't you want guys to like. Or... I know there's so much debate on the legal authority, the constitutionality, the segregation, the discrimination. But you know, we all know that the vaccine isn't anything that's bulletproof. But what it does sure. is it you know lessens the severity of COVID and um, right. Yeah, you guys, you guys have it all right. And, you know, I'm sure you guys talked to Lillian and I'm sure you guys talked to GRMC. And again, uh, like I said earlier, when you just look at the numbers every morning about those who are hospitalized and those who are unvaccinated, and you just wished that um, they would have reconsidered their decision or took an earlier opportunity to get vaccinated, um, you know, it, it's heartbreaking, right? I mean, you know, you've heard a recent story of, of, a, of a recent passing where that person was unvaccinated and may have had the chance to survive. And you talk about people who could possibly be on ventilators and you talk about people and, and doctors and nurses who are exhausted on the front line. Um, that's the reality that we're looking at in terms of, uh, of this virus. Uh, we, look at, we look to the hospitals to tell us the true story uh, of what's happening in our community. And so I'm asking everybody to please take the time, um, you know, go back again, do the research, utilize, utilize the full faith and approval of the Federal Drug Administration um, to uh, fully authorize the use of the Pfizer vaccine. And I'm sure we'll see the rest coming in the coming weeks and months uh, for full um, authorization. Right. This is our opportunity to just kind of pause and say, if this is for me, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it for myself and I'm gonna do it for our community. And that's the only thing we can ask our people to do is head out to the vaccination sites, do your research, make the decision. And we pray and hope that it is one that you would do to protect our community. Thank you, John. We do have a caller actually on the line. Um, Good morning. Ma'am, I think you had a question about the, so is it the rise you have a question about or the all rise? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, You're on. It's pertaining to the question you were asking uh, Mr. John about. Um, Why is it you guys talk about transparency and all, and even the governor, she always thinks that in her... Re, I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback, feedback on my yeah. side. I don't is know. The if it's radio on? It's, it, there's a lot of feedback in there. Yeah. Can, can you turn on your radio, ma'am? Is that better? Yeah. Yes. And, and speak up a little bit. 
Okay, so my question is, why is it that we're always hearing that they are they're they're transparent about everything? Um, if it's a secret, why why can't you tell the people of Guam because they need to know the legislation as well because they also want to know. I mean, this is money coming from the federal. This is not the money coming from the governor. It's not her own personal money. I mean, what is she, that enough? And she's going to give another. Um, pay raise to the nurses didn't they just had a pay raise already and then they're giving them another one again ma'am so what was your question so my question is why is why are they lying about the transparency i mean they're only it's like they only want us to know like example giving money to gpa and gwa and to the nurses but how about the rest of the money you know, we, we need to know what is it going for. I mean, don't, so, don't we have to say that also? I mean, not just the not just the governor herself. I mean, why 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 can't she just listen to her the people of Guam and um, answer the question and not so, lie about it and go around the bush? Sure. So, Thank how did you, you know about all that money being spent for Rise and GPA and the nurses and all that kind of stuff? I think she's uh, off the line now, John. Uh, oh, okay. It sounds like she's well, wondering my, why why aren't we getting yeah, at sure. the plan? So my point, yeah. yeah so, so my point to that to her to her question was um, the fact that um, you know where mo where the ARP money is going to be spent, notwithstanding some of the you know the specific provisions, um, is in uh, our ability to announce and sh and to share the people share with the people where this money is going to in terms of direct relief. So that's that's my first point. Uh, my second point is, you know, um, with regard to the nurses that the nurses pay, you know, I have to commend Senator Mary Camacho Torres over the Guam legislature for, um, you know, joining the administration in in um, asking for a, a pay review and a pay or a pay study, and the implementation of these pay raises for our nurses. Uh, I think nobody can argue the fact that if there was ever a time to do that, it would be now. And so we were committed to those two things. How much has been spent already in the uh, ARPA uh, ARP funds? I don't have, I, let me get that number to you. I'll have Lester, uh, DBMR, get that number to you and DOA. Okay. Do you know if the, the US EPA, if any of the representatives arrived to Guam yet? I know the governor mentioned it during a press yeah, conference. Yeah, uh, you know, Brian, I just got note that uh, they are, I, I believe if they not, if they didn't already arrive, um, they're they're going to be arriving any, any minute or any day soon. So yes, uh, we did get confirmation that they will be boots on the ground if they're not already here. And so, you know, um, that was a, a big thing when we were in Region 9 uh, in California, San Francisco. Um, you know, the governor, um, you know, uh, had to, had a discussion with uh, US EPA, the deputy administrator there, and they committed to getting a, a team on the ground to have the, the uh, property reviewed. Okay. So they're going to conduct a, an assessment look into possible violations of the Clean Water Act? And Correct, yes. OK. All right. Thank you, John. Hey, John, yes. I really appreciate uh, your time this morning. And uh, it was definitely, a, I know that it's, uh, you're busy every morning. So uh, it was grateful you're able to block okay. off uh, a good a good chunk of time to address our questions. No, absolutely. Bree, Chris, thanks for um, everything you guys are doing out there. I appreciate it. OK, thanks, John. John. Stay okay. safe. Uh, Jay, can we just quickly go to the uh, Catherine of the Guam Chamber? Yeah. I know that there's a, a big meeting that she's got to jump into. Hi, Kathy. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Right on. So I'm uh, not even.